known uh, Christian grad students, Christian professors of philosophy. Um, the overall impression that I've consistently gotten uh, is that the run of the mill Christian philosopher uh, thinks that the moral argument is just a bad argument. Welcome to the second episode of the sci-fi show. We're not talking about science fiction, but science and philosophy, and in particular, how they intersect with the philosophy of religion. And we have, of course, my two absolute favorite atheist thinkers, Alex Malpass and Dan Linford. How are you doing, guys? Good. Good. Thanks. You haven't got any crazy drink this time, Alex. I'm drinking water today. Okay. <laughs> it's recording earlier. I've got... It is earlier than we recorded last time, yeah. Um, so today we're going to dive into the moral argument. Um, you know, last time we talked about the slaughter of the Canaanites and whether that could be justified, but it does touch on this moral argument for God. And we're going to use William Lane Craig's popular video on the topic as a sort of template uh, for two reasons. One, it's beautifully produced. They did a, a fantastic job in making that, uh, even though we disagree with the content. Uh, but the other thing is, it's probably the most viewed version of the moral argument. There are different versions, but this is the one I think has been the most viewed, so I think demands attention. So let's just start with the um, basic setup of the argument from that video. If God does not exist, objective moral values and duties do not exist. But objective moral values and duties do exist. Therefore, God exists. Alex, you, when we were chatting on WhatsApp, you've got uh, an alternative version of the argument that comes to the opposite conclusion. <laughs> do you want to sort of lay that out? Yeah, so it was just, I had this idea, um, which was involved in the defense of the first premise, but um, it made me think that like, if I was going down that route, I could construct a kind of parody version of the argument, right? So my version of the argument is basically just like in the slightly negated version of that one. So it's instead of saying, um, unless God exists, subjective morals and duties don't exist. Um, I'm saying, unless God doesn't exist, moral duties don't, the moral values and duties don't exist. Um, but they do, so therefore he doesn't. Um, so I'm kind of, kind of twisting it around, so I'm coming to the opposite conclusion. So I had it, Alex, I had it, is, is this right? Premise one, objective moral values don't exist if God exists. Premise two, moral values do exist. Conclusion, therefore, God does not exist. Yeah. Is that right? Easier way of saying it, but saying the same thing. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So I'm basically saying counterintuitively that God's existence is incompatible with uh, objective moral values and duties. And so, like, strictly speaking, that's not, it's a bit too ambitious, but like, I, I, don't, I don't actually think it's, it's um, incompatible because you can just imagine some version of um, moral realism and just supplant that by saying also God exists, right? And I don't think there's a contradiction there. So I mean, technically speaking, I don't, I don't really defend the argument uh, in its fullest sense, but I do think there's a sense in which premise one is true. And it's really just uh, the sense in which Craig <laughs> thinks that God contributes to or grounds morality. Um, so I think that if that's your view, then you're in trouble, basically. So do you want me to yeah, can you unpack that? Why are you in trouble? Like, how do you defend this first premise? I think the theist who likes the moral argument is going to agree with premise two. But what about this first premise? Right. The problem is that um, on Craig's view, so Craig defends this um, Alston's view of uh, divine command theory, which basically just says um, moral duty, uh, moral values um, are instantiated by God's nature, more or less, and uh, and duties are commands that God issues to us, right? So that's, you've got this kind of theistic reduction, I guess, or explanation of what moral values and duties are in a theistic context. And um, it just seems to me that actually what's going on there is that, that that's a species of subjectivism, right? It means, what, what I'm saying is that uh, for something to be objective, it just means that it's got to be uh, true or exist independently of um, any observers or the minds of, of any of anyone right so like for instance um, there's like a cup on my table right now and that's that fact is true regardless of what I believe or any attitudes that I have about that cup right? it doesn't matter what my attitude is it's going to be true independently of anybody's attitudes whatsoever but like if I tell you a joke and I say that it's funny you don't laugh um, you know, that, that just is indicating that the, the funniness of the joke isn't objective like that. It just depends upon your point of view and your attitudes entirely. And if you but made you know, it... Isn't like, life with Brian objectively funny? Uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> no, nothing's objectively funny. Um, and the point is that, like, if you made a joke and, like, literally nobody thinks it's funny, 
then it's not like because it requires like funniness requires attitudes in order for it to be the case but a cup being on a table doesn't require any attitudes to be there but now if we think about the grounding morality in god's uh, nature and his commands it seems to me that what's going on there is that we are requiring that there is this attitude this agent with a bunch of attitudes in order for those for that grounding to to make sense um in which case it's not mind independent it's very much dependent on upon there being a mind right maybe a divine mind but that doesn't really make any difference right objective you know the definition of objective isn't just that um it's independent of all human observers or something, right? It's just independent of observers. So a completely robust notion of moral objectivity just means that it doesn't require there to be any minds at all. And if that- and God is a mind, right? God is a mind, yeah. So you can't have divine um, command theory without a divine mind. And if objectivity means independently of any minds, then the two things are in conflict with each other. So that's basically why I'm saying, if that's your idea of how morality works on theism, then it's just incompatible with the notion of objective, like robust objective uh, morality. So the two things are incompatible with each other. So then just set up a modus ponens to express that, right? If um, God exists, then objective morality doesn't, right? And that's, that's all I mean by that, is it just that kind of divine command theory um, is incompatible with objective uh, ethics, in which case, if there are objective moral values and duties and that account of God uh, must be false. Yeah. Dan, what, what are you, your thoughts on this? Uh, can we run a parody argument? Maybe, what do you think of this one? Is there another one you could run? Yeah, right. Uh, so I think, I think Alex is right that you can run a parody argument of that, of that kind that seems plausible to me, but there's another kind of parody argument that one can run. So a long time ago, at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, there was a philosopher named G. E. Moore who was interested in um, whether we could know that there's an external world. And what he points out is that whatever kind of argument you have for the non-existence of the external world or for being skeptical of the external world, uh, its premises are going to be more controversial than the conclusion that, we, that either there is no external world or that we can't know that there's an external world. Um, so he suggests taking whatever argument you have against uh, our knowledge or the existence of an external world, and you can flip it upside down. Um, but likewise, uh, Craig's moral argument can be flipped upside down. So notice that for the atheist, so the atheist is going to think that they have good independent reason to think that there is no God. They're also going to have, uh, if, if, Craig's, if Craig's defense of his second premise succeeds, that is, if we do have good reason to think that there are objective moral facts, or that morality is objective, uh, then whatever those reasons are, whatever kind of defense Craig gives for his second premise, is going to be equally available to the atheist. Because at least insofar as Craig doesn't beg the question against the atheist, um, those that defense needs to be neutral between atheism and theism. So the atheist can put those two things together and then say that, well, actually on his, uh, on his view, on his or her view, the, uh, it's both the case that God does not exist and that morality is objective. And notice that they can say that without even knowing, having any idea about how it is that morality could be, could be grounded. Um, but that actually, so this question about like how, their, how morality could be grounded brings us to the other point that I wanted to uh, raise here, which is that when uh, religious apologists or certain Christian philosophers like William Lane Craig raise the moral argument, they do so in what seems to me like almost complete ignorance of the entire 2,400-year history of philosophy. I mean, it's really astounding, right? So ever since... The beginning of, of philosophy, at least in the Western world, ever since Plato and Aristotle, we've had theories according to which morality is objective, but it has nothing to do with God. And so you have to be ignorant of that entire history in order to think that there couldn't be any possible way that a morality could be objective if God didn't exist. Um, I mean, imagine that you're in this situation. Imagine that you uh, are currently a theist and you believe in objective morality. You come up with some good reason to think that God doesn't exist, so you change your mind. Why would you also change your mind about the objectivity of, of morality? It seems to me that what you should do instead, at least if you know anything about the history of Western philosophy, is that you should say, oh, it must be that morality is objective, but what explains morality is one of these other accounts from the entire, from this vast history of, uh, of philosophy. Right. Okay. So actually, I think just to show to the audience, because they might think, oh, this is kind of bizarre. I thought 
if objective moral and values duties exist, then God must exist. I thought it'd be worth just looking at the Field Papers Survey, which is the largest survey that I know of, of philosophers, and uh, see what it says, because I think that people might be surprised. So here we see that uh, this thing, meta ethics, moral realism, moral realism, I think is just another word for uh, whether morals are objective. It's a technical term. You'll see that most philosophers are moral realists. Um, uh, however, what you also see is that most philosophers are also atheists. So I think that shows you um, that most philosophers think you can ground objective morals um, without God. And then I, I also thought it'd be worth looking at this. So here they polled philosophers about what they thought was the best arguments for God. And you can see that the moral argument comes uh, right at the bottom by one measure and second from the bottom by another. And I think that's uh, not unconnected uh, with our first two images. OK, so let's move on to the second clip. Without some objective reference point, we have no way of saying that something is really up or down. God's nature provides an objective reference point for moral values. It's the standard against which all actions and decisions are measured. Dan, what are your thoughts on this? How do we uh, get this up and down? As yeah, analogy? right. So Craig tells us that God's nature is the objective reference point for moral values and is the standard against which all actions and decisions are measured. However, uh, many philosophers, including myself, are going to say that there can be objective moral facts without the existence of some reference point for moral values and without the existence of a standard against which all actions and decisions are measured. So Alex already uh, said that, you know, Craig bases his uh, ethical theory on the modified divine command theory offered by Alston. He also draws from Robert Adams. And so these folks, uh, they draw a distinction between goodness and badness on one hand and moral duty on the other. That is, uh, what's right or wrong to do. Now, when explaining the first thing, when explaining goodness, Craig endorses what's called exemplar theory. According to exemplar theory, have some property is just to resemble some item that serves a prototypical example of having that property. So for example, uh, the clip discusses an exemplar theory of upness and downness. Without a reference point, there's no such thing as upness and downness. Another example that you'll see in the literature involves a standard meter bar in Paris. It used to be that for some item to be a meter long, uh, all it took was that that item had the appropriate sort of relationship as, to the standard meter bar in Paris, right? That had the same length, in other words, as the standard meter bar in Paris. What Craig claims is that to be good is just to resemble God in some appropriate respect. In that case, God is the exemplar of goodness. But crucially, objective moral facts only require a standard if exemplar theory is true. And many philosophers are going to think, I uh, do think, that exemplar theory is false when it comes to moral properties. So for example, long before there was a standard meter bar, there was still an objective fact about the length of a stegosaurus tail. Goodness could be like the length of a stegosaurus tail and so, not and so wouldn't require a standard. So all of us who reject exemplar theory when it comes to moral properties have reason to reject Craig's view that objective moral goodness requires any sort of standard. Alex, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, there's loads of things to say about this. So, I mean, on the one hand, um, it's kind of strange to have a moral, an exemplar theory, it seems to me, where the measuring stick is um, infinitely, you know, um, it, it exemplifies an infinite version of that thing. Because, you know, I, I could, you know, get a length of word or something and hold it up to the meter rule and see that it matches. But nothing I ever do will be as good as anything that God does, right? Because he's maximally perfect or whatever. So in a sense, everybody always falls short. Nothing actually ever gets measured correctly against that. So it's not clear how it's playing that role. I mean, what's the point of a meter stick standard that nothing can actually match up to, right? So it's not clear how it's, that, it's a, uh, that it's similar to this exemplar thing, right? Um, and I think there's another thing that Morriston says about this, which is that like, it sort of gets the order of explanation the wrong way around. I mean, uh, nobody, um, it seems to me, actually in practice measures anything up against God in order to determine whether it's good or not. Actually, it, I mean, phenomenologically, you're gonna live your life finding out what's right and wrong a long time before you consider these sort of lofty theological notions. And clearly we just know right and wrong through just much more mundane things, interactions with other humans and 
getting told about stuff and finding out about it. None of it involves measuring itself, uh, measuring these concepts up against some theological notion. It's not even clear how you do that. So it just feels like it's been added on post hoc and then turned into this thing that must be like the measuring stick or something. Um, I mean, we we could talk about this absolutely all day. This is just to touch on the exemplar um, aspect of this, right? I, I guess we might dive into this more, but I mean, there's all these problems to do with like what, like if goodness, if good, like something being good, like charity is good in virtue of it being instantiated in God's nature. Um, I think we're going to come to this later. So maybe yeah, I'll we'll come to that or when we come to the youth of yeah. dilemma. But it was interesting. I thought they, the properties they put up, they had like love, truth, patience, grace. I mean, how did they know they were the properties? I mean, certainly if you believe in the biblical God, I see properties like jealousy, wrathfulness, yeah. anger, discrimination, um, intolerance. <laughs> um, they all seem to be properties of the biblical God. So, I mean, I don't get how they got those properties. Where did they, it seems like they just pulled them out. So the I think C.S. Lewis has something really important to see. I figure where C.S. Lewis writes this, but uh, Lewis has this argument that if you look at the evidence we find in the in the world, what theologians sometimes call the book of nature, right? So in other words, if you look at the universe outside of your own being, then you'll never come to the conclusion there's a perfectly good God behind it all. Um, there's just simply too much pain and suffering and so on. And, you know, this weird mixture of goodness and badness, as Hume would put it. But if you look inside of yourself, maybe you find the moral law written, written there. Uh, What's sort of peculiar about that claim is that it means that there's this whole wealth of, of evidence that we have about who or what might have created the world that we're supposed to just sort of disregard when it comes to evaluating the um, what might lie behind the entire universe. I mean, if I look at in my intuitions, I think things like homosexuality is fine. There's nothing wrong with that. I think eating animals is wrong. But if I re read the Bible, I'm going to get the opposite. So it seems to me, if I can look inside my intuitions, I should reject the biblical God. And if I can't, then any argument based on my moral intuitions is going to be problematic. Right. right. And I, I think this is a really important point. Like I, so there are very few moral claims that are as obvious to me as the claim that there is nothing at all morally objectionable about homosexuality. I can't even imagine what an argument for the immorality of homosexuality would look like other than just an argument from divine fiat or something. Um, I, independent of the Bible, there are no ethical theories uh, for which you could reach that conclusion as a plausible entailment. I, mean, I think that they will. Conservatives would say that it, you know, undermines values or something that we need to keep things going in society or whatever. But that—that that seems to me the best you could possibly come up with. Right? This is something about same-sex relationships undermines the sanctity of marriage or something. I mean, I don't really get that. that. That just feels wrong. Because, I mean, we're going off topic here quite a lot. But yeah, like, of we, we <laughs> pretend to be straight and have marriages where they're like pretending the whole time. That, that's not a good thing, right? That just means, well, anyway. I think there's a sense in which this kind of ethical theory, like an ethical theory that is too dependent upon divine revelation, sort of stunts one's moral development, right? Because what it trains you to do is to look for uh, moral proclamations from some sort of authority figure as opposed to doing the hard work of reasoning out what might be uh, right or wrong for yourself. And I think that that's incredibly dangerous. I think that it, uh, it, it, leads to, um, it leads people to have a really stunted conception of what it means um, to even think about morality in the first place. And the fact that it's so prevalent uh, really worries me about where our society is and where our society might head. Yeah, given that you said that, let me just jump in. We can move on to the next clip in just a second, but it feels like a really natural point to, to make this um, point as well. But it seems to me one of the problems with this divine command theory is that like, it offers a completely un, un edifying and unsatisfying explanation of um, what's right and wrong. I mean, fundamentally, something's right or well, something's good if... It's exemplified by God's character. Something is is obligatory if it's commanded by God. But you know that there doesn't seem to be anything deeper. Like, why did He command this? Why why has He got those character traits? Like, there can't be any answer to that question. One of the problems with theory. But like, you could think that you can explain those things. Like, for instance, if I say 
charity is good. I don't just have to say, well, it's good because somebody said that you should be charitable and that's it. There's nothing else to say about it, which is what the domain command theorist basically says. In actual fact, well, you can you can analyze the concept further and say something about like, well, charity is about redistributing stuff. So like if I've got too much stuff and there's someone who's got not enough stuff, I give them some of my stuff. I barely even notice. It's hardly any bad for me, but it's massive good for them. And what I'm doing is like I'm evening stuff out. And it just means, it's, you know, and that's natural for me to think about it in terms of like um, there being some kind of quotient of good and bad in the world. And like I'm helping to redistribute that and make it more equitable. Like that's explaining what's good about charity. It's the same thing like if you say, well, what's bad about torture? Well, one person is like making another person suffer like that. You can explain, you know, you can certainly offer some kind of analysis that goes a bit deeper than just saying, well, somebody said not to do it. That's why it's bad. You know, that, that just feels like it's so shallow. It really, and I think that's what the point you were making now, to sort of stunt your ability to understand yeah. what's going on in morality. If all you think um, that something being wrong is just because a big man told you not to do it, you don't really understand anything about why it's bad. It's like a child's understanding. You know, mummy tells you not to eat from the cookie jar, so you don't do it. But you don't really know why. You don't understand anything about what's going on. You just know what not to do. So, yeah, I completely agree. I completely agree with that. All right, so now we are going to move on. Okay. So let's go to God's command. So, in a world without God, there can be no evil and no good, nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. God has expressed his moral nature to us as commands. These provide the basis for moral duties. For example, God's essential attribute of love is expressed in his command to love your neighbor as yourself. This command provides a foundation upon which we can affirm the objective goodness of generosity, self-sacrifice, and equality. And we can condemn as objectively evil, greed, abuse, and discrimination. Okay, so I, actually before we come on to you guys, I, I just want to know, I think there's a misquote of Dawkins there. And the reason mm -hmm. I say that is because they miss something out that I think is crucial. So let me give you a, a more fuller quote. Uh, open quotes. This is from Dawkins. Sorry. Open quote, the universe that we observe has precisely the properties we should expect if there is at the bottom no design, no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing but pitiless indifference. And it's, it's a close quote. So it's that bit at bottom that I think is crucial. I, I think you could interpret that as saying, well, there might still be good and evil, but it's not there in the fundamental nature of reality, just as cats are not there in the fundamental nature of reality. Uh, at bottom, there are no cats. There's just, you know whatever the fundamental constituents of reality are, quantum fields or something. It doesn't mean cats don't exist. And I don't think, and clearly Dawkins does think design exists. He thinks humans design things. And he says that at bottom, there's no design. So I think that, I don't know, a bit of a misquote there. But anyway, let's put that to the side and um, tell us what you think about this uh, approach to morality here. Alex, why don't you start us off? Okay, so um, yeah. in, that, in that clip, um, they offer the um, love thy neighbor as thyself kind of, um, what is it, um, Sermon on the Mount, Jesus uh, commandment, right? Um, first of all, it doesn't sound like a very good commandment to me anyway, right? It's um, actually quite self sense because it's kind of got it backwards, right? You shouldn't treat your neighbor as you want to be treated. You should treat your neighbor as they want to be treated. Right? Jesus actually just gets it wrong, just drops the ball on the most obvious main crucial thing he ever said, he actually just gets that wrong. Treating other, everyone like you want to be treated is like um, selfish, frankly. It's like um, not empathetic towards what other people uh, might want. So you should hope that other people treat you like you want to be treated, but you should fear them treating you like they want to be treated, right? Because they, they might want anything. Who knows what they want? Um, you could be a masochist, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, they might want to have all of their money stolen. I don't know what they want, right? But who, that's not cool. I don't want to tether my treatment to what somebody else wants. So it, Jesus gets that wrong. Um, it's a stupid thing to say. Uh, so anyway, moving on from that, supposing he said it the right way around. Um, still, it's not clear that you can really derive the rest of ethics just from that one sentence. I mean, it's, it's it, right. It, it really does depend. A lot of stuff depends on what's going on. And it just seems to me that like, the fundamental problem here is that God doesn't issue commands on every old thing. Like God doesn't tell me whether or not I should punch you in the face right now. I mean, he, he doesn't specifically make a commandment about that. 
So they have to say, well, he said some general commandments and from them you can derive everything that you need to. But clearly people disagree about what you should, what the consequences are from like vague or like universal sounding maxims that we're supposed to um, appeal to. But what we need is specific commands or uh, a way of, you know, understanding what all of the entailments are from a general command. We, we don't get that. So it just seems hopeless to think that you can, you, you can do I mean, we didn't see the logical expansion of the deduction, of course, from that one sentence to generosity being good and that torture being bad. We didn't didn't get that. Um, it just seems to me that you probably can't get that anyway. Well, I'd, I'd like to see the effort if someone was to try and go through steps and logically derive, you know, charity is good as the conclusion from love thy neighbour as yourself. I mean, I just... It doesn't define what a neighbour is because it could mean love everyone in your tribe and to hell with everybody else. Well, that's true. Yeah, right. Well, Don't love the Canaanites. Like, yeah, exactly. I mean, well, he's cherry picking the commands because it was a command to kill all the Canaanites. What about that command? Yeah, that's Dan, cool. your... Yeah, yeah, go. Dan. So I think that Alex raises a really good points here. I think we can even go further. We shouldn't treat people the way that they want to be treated either, at least not as not universally, because perhaps there are people who the way that they want to be treated would then involve you in some bit of you know, some violation about some other duty that you have. Uh, in Rush Schaefer Landau's uh, ethics textbook called Fundamentals of Ethics, in the chapter on, or one of the chapters on uh, deontology and Kant's ethics, he opens the chapter by discussing um, some like revisions you can make to the golden rule. And he goes through both of these, the original golden rule plus Alex's revision. And then he suggests um, Kant's bit about whether a, you know, a, a maxim is universalizable um, as a further refinement of the, of the golden rule. Um, I think that there's another thing that we can say here about the connection between commands and, and duties. So on Craig's view, uh, somehow the, the commands that God issues result in the various obligations that we that we have but i don't understand how this view could possibly work the reason i don't understand how this view could possibly work is because i don't understand how it is that you could have the obligation to obey god's commands in the first place so let's suppose for the sake of argument that you didn't already have an obligation to obey god's commands well in that case if god commanded you to obey god's commands that wouldn't create the obligation because it wouldn't create any sort of obligation if you didn't already have an obligation to obey god's commands um, sometimes what Craig says is that the, what, what does the explanatory work here, um, is something about the nature of God. So God is a legitimate authority, Craig says, and we have an obligation to obey the commands given by legitimate authority. Well, that won't work because on that view, there's at least one obligation that we have that's not the result of a divine command, namely the obligation to obey the commands given by a legitimate authority. Moreover, if it's legitimate for uh, Craig to say that it's the, like the nature of something could generate an obligation, well then equally so, the, why can't the uh, person who thinks that ethics is independent of God say that the nature of some actions or the outcomes of some actions or something like that could generate an obligation either to perform that action or not to perform that action. So for example, uh, if an action would just result in unending suffering for an infinite number of, of years, then a lot of ethicists are going to say that that fact alone, something about the nature of suffering, gives us, gives us um, an obligation or a duty not to perform an action of that sort. Uh, so, you know, sometimes Craig says that instead of saying that we have an obligation to obey the commands given by legitimate authority, Craig says, well, there's no difference between um obligations or duties on the one hand and god's commands on the other there's one in the same thing and since they're one in the same thing the question as to why we have an obligation to obey god's commands doesn't arise well, i don't understand how that could work either because you can have one without the other in other words uh even if you can't have my the obligations that i have without my existence right my obligations only exist if i exist but on the other hand uh if if I didn't exist, God could still issue the command, uh, the same commands that God apparently issued. So God could command uh, not to kill, even if I didn't exist. Whereas my obligation not to kill couldn't exist if I didn't exist. So it can't be that my obligation and God's commands are one and the same thing, 
rather it has to be that somehow my obligations arise from God's commands, or as Craig sometimes puts it, that my obligations are determined by uh, God's commands. But in that case, uh, we again are, are left without an explanation for how the explanatory job is supposed to work here. How do we get from some set of divine commands to the actual obligations that I have? The other thing is, um, uh, how do we know what God's commands are? I mean, you might say, well, via some supernatural act, you know, that will tell you it's God. But even within the Bible, there are other supernatural beings. There are angels, there are a devil, there's a devil, there's the devil's minions. So how could I possibly know what God's commands are? I don't, I don't see it. Well, they're self-authenticating, you see. So oh, that... yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, right. Yeah, but there's a yeah, there's trouble even there because I'm sure whether he said it, and I checked it, and he did say it. He did, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's a, that's a standard Protestant move when discussing how to, uh, you know, know that um, one's reading of scripture, for example, is is correct. Um, but there's a further issue here, which is that so let's suppose that uh, legitimate divine relation was self-authenticating. So therefore, all the people who, who legitimately receive revelation from God uh, know that they have because of its self-authenticating nature. Nonetheless, it could also be the case that there's someone who believes that their experience was self-authenticating, even though it wasn't. Right? What they have to claim is not just that uh, people who you know, are in the know know that they are, but also that people who aren't in the know, couldn't be mistaken about that. And so it's, you know, so th therefore the, you know, they, they don't actually have grounds here for saying that they are one of the, uh, the individuals that has received genuine divine revelation. All they are in the position to say is that they believe that they have, uh, that their experience was self-authenticating in the right sort of way. Yeah. All right, so let's move on to the youth approach dilemma. Well, hold on, just before we, just because it's really funny. Uh, I was listening to the um, uh, Wielenberg Craig debate because it's on this topic, and uh, towards the end, someone asks Craig, um, "How you know a question that's along the lines of like, why should I uh, obey God's commands? Right? Don't I have to already think that I need to obey His commands in order for any of them to have any force?" Which is a bit like what you were saying before, Dan, about like you know there has to be some command that's not given by God's authority and for us to get going in the first place. And Craig, Craig actually said something which I found incredible. It was, it was um, I don't know if this is a settled response of his or if it was off the top of his head, but he said something like, well, look, sometimes um, self-referentiality is fine. Like, you know, all of the things said in this debate uh, is uh, part of the things that were said in this debate. So that's fine. So in the same way, um, you should follow God's commands because he's commanded you to follow all of his commands. And that's fine. And um, for some reason, I guess it was really close towards the end of the time, and Wienerberg didn't really push back on it at all. Um, but I just thought, that's, this is blatantly circular. What are you talking about? How can you possibly say that? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's, that's one of the things. I think Wienerberg didn't push back because it was a QA, and a so they didn't, he didn't necessarily have a response to push back. Okay, maybe. Yeah. Maybe. maybe. Uh, that's my recollection anyway. All right, so let's move on to the Euthyphro dilemma and how they respond to it. So they do actually play out what the Euthyphro dilemma is here, and then they give a, a very quick response. So let's have a look. Is something good just because God wills it, or does God will something because it is good? The answer is neither one. Rather, God wills something because he is good. Let me start off at least. So there's this good paper by this guy, Jeremy Coons, on this topic. So I can't remember what it's called, but maybe we can chuck a link to it in the description or something, um, where he explains why this um solution does its purported solution doesn't really work but the contours of the idea is super easy to see anyway right like the, the thought is just that um it's not really addressing the problem it's just moving the area in which the problem is going to appear to somewhere else right and it's a bit like the um the notion of the revenge in the liar paradox where sometimes the solutions come in they seem like they patch it up and then the problem just reappears in a different form uh, a higher... Alex, not everyone will be familiar with the liar paradox. Do you want to yeah, just... yeah. so those who are? It's a bit like the revenge paradox, uh, the okay. revenge phenomenon in that uh, setting. Uh, maybe we'll do that topic another day. Um, anyway, the, what's going on here is that um, Craig's trying to say, look, it's God just is good, right? His nature kind of grounds um, the the goodness here. So instead of him having to say, well, look. I'm um, saying that charity is good because charity is independently good of me and I'm just reporting that fact to you. Or him saying, 
charity isn't good in itself, but it's only good because God wills it, which leaves open this kind of arbitrariness worry. God think, um, Craig thinks he can kind of cut the middle ground here by saying, no, no, uh, God says charity is good because he's charitable. Right? It's part of his nature. Um, but you just re rephrase this kind of euthyphro dilemma again by just like asking, well, you know, how come uh, God is charitable? Right. How come that's part of his nature? It, it, you better not say it's because charity is good, because that would make it circular again. Right? We've just said we've just said you, you don't want to say that charity is independently good. Otherwise, that's just the first horn of the euthyphro dilemma again. Right? So if you can't say that God is charitable because charity is good, um, it seems to me that the only other option that you've got is to say that he's just he just is. You know, I mean, uh, otherwise, or, or, or I suppose you could take the other option of the euthyphro dilemma, which would be to say that, um, well, it, actually, no, I don't see that there's another option for you to throw that in here, because, I mean, if, if, if you're saying that charity is good just because it's part of God's nature, uh, that's fine. But then, I'm, but then I'm, that's where I start off this next round of questioning, like, how come uh, charity is part of God's nature? Because in theory, you know, logically, it could have been, you know, uh, the, the preponderance towards torture was part of God's nature instead. And what, what would we say in that case, like, that torturing people was good then, because it resembles God's nature? Um, so, like, I think that the theist basically just has to say, look, God just has maybe necessarily a bunch of features and they are only good in virtue of him having them. Like, that's the point here. You, you really aren't avoiding one of the horns of the dilemma. You're just really taking one of the horns, the one which says X is good uh, because God wills it. And you're just changing that into X is good because it's part of God's nature, character or something. Um, right. But then. There's no, if I ask why charity is part of God's nature, there's, there can't be any deeper explanation. Certainly the, the most natural thing to think is that you were going to say, well, look, it's, it's part of his nature because he's, because charity is independently good. You just have to say, well, it just is, right? But then if we were to do, the great thing about Wielenberg's approach in their debate was that he was, he offered this kind of partners in crime, like objection thing, where it's like, sometimes you can offer an objection, but if it applies to both of our positions equally, it doesn't really do anything in telling between the two views on the table here. And, you know, the kind of atheistic moral Platonist might want to say something like, look, goodness is associated with charity, supervenes on charity or something. It just does, right? And if Craig wants to say, well, how come? Maybe goodness could supervene on, on torture or something instead. He's going to say, look, it just does. And then maybe it's necessary that it does. And if that doesn't sound very satisfying, the point is that you get to that same destination when, when you're analyzing how this works on the divine command theory. They have to say at some point that it just is that God is charitable. And that's it. There's, there can't be, he'll keep going down forever. So if anything, really, it seems to me when you compare the two theories, you've got like a kind of slimmer version of that theory, the kind of Wielenberg, a more realist version. And the theist just takes you on this unnecessary detour around like God's nature. Right. And then you get to the same endpoint, which is just how it just is. <laughs> and they're both making the same conceptual move. So that, that seems to me like one of the most crucial Things that, and I think that that's basically all in that Jeremy Kuhn's paper. Um, so, yeah. Dan, any thoughts so, before we move on? Yeah. You know, I used to teach the youth of a dilemma when I taught intro ethics. Um, and one of the things I used to say to students is that, so look, you know, there's these two arms of the youth of a dilemma. One of them is that something is good or it's right to do just because God has commanded it or willed it or whatever. Imagine by way of analogy that uh, a parent tells a child to do something. And sometimes when a parent tells a child to do something, the child says, why should I do that? And the parent says, well, because I said so. Now, in, in that case, what's going on really is that the parent has all sorts of reasons that the parent recognizes for their, uh, for issuing the command that the parent issued, but that they don't think the child would have, is in the position yet to understand. But on this arm of the youth with the dilemma, it's, it's not that way, right? It's as if the parent says, because I said so, and that's the end of the story. There's no further reason that the parent recognizes. There just is no further story. It's completely arbitrary that that's uh, the way it is. And so when it comes to uh, God's nature, you know, we could say, um, you know, either it's the case that God has some set of attributes because God is good, or it's the case that uh, these set of attributes are good because God has them. And on the latter, uh, you know, that's the case in which it just turns out that there's no further explanation. It's like if you ask the, you ask the theologian, uh, well, why, in virtue of what is God good? And, if, and they said, well, 
there is no further story to be told. And it's not that the theologian doesn't like know a further story. It's that in fact, as a logical point, independent of whatever the theologian knows, there's no further story to be told. There's not even, not even God has a further story that they can offer. And that makes it look like the statement that God is good is just completely arbitrary, stripped of all explanatory content. Whereas more typically, if you ask, say, a preacher or a lay Christian, why, uh, why we should think that God is good, they might say, oh, well, God is loving, God is generous, God does all these things for us, right? It's in virtue of all these attributes that we say that, that God is good. And that, that seems to me like the better story to be told. But then what they're saying is that it's, it's not that God grounds goodness or that God is goodness itself. Rather, God is an instance of a good thing. The most good a thing could possibly be, perhaps, the best sort of thing that something could be, but still just an instance of a good thing instead of being the identified with the property of goodness itself. All right, so let's move on to the a topic I'm particularly keen on is uh, animals. So let's see what they For the say. atheist, yeah. humans are just accidents of nature, highly evolved animals. But animals have no moral obligations to one another. When a cat kills a mouse, it hasn't done anything morally wrong. The cat's just being a cat. If God doesn't exist, we should view human behavior in the same way. No action should be considered morally right or wrong. But the problem is, good and bad, right and wrong, do exist. I thought it weird there they said for the atheists we are highly evolved animals. Surely they're atheists that accept <laughs> that evolution took place and we got here <laughs> via a process of evolution. But, um, right, so why is it wrong for us to kill, but not for a cat to kill? Is there something, do we have to rely on God for that? Dan, you had something to say about this. Yeah, so, you know, if I, I have a cat, uh, Meow Face, I'm wondering why isn't it wrong for Meow Face to kill a mouse? Well, there's a very simple story to be told that has nothing to do with God. Meow Face doesn't understand the difference between right and wrong. And we say exactly the same thing about human beings. A toddler doesn't have the same kind of response, same kind of moral responsibility as, as an adult. A mentally handicapped person also doesn't have the same kind of responsibilities as an adult, um, or as a neurotypical person, rather. Uh, you know, we recognize that people who are neurotypical adults have the ability to recognize moral rightness and moral wrongness in ways that these other um, these other entities cannot, and that explains why they have the obligations that we recognize them to have, um, and why all these other cases things don't. And, you know, since I recognize the difference between right and wrong, that also means that I have an obligation to stop Meow Face from torturing a mouse. Um, so she doesn't do anything right or wrong when she tortures a mouse. But if I looked on as she tortured a mouse and did nothing, then I have skirted one of my own responsibilities. Yeah, I've had to stop my cats <laughs> from torturing mice. Although one of them just played with it without eating it and then let it go. So maybe they're more moral. I don't know. <laughs> uh, Alex, any thoughts on this? Well, yeah, I mean, Dan's absolutely right, of course, that uh, this is a completely standard uh, line to be drawn in uh, moral philosophy. I mean, you'd say it's a notion of what a moral agent is. The moral agent is one whose rational capacity is, uh, allows them to, to be aware of moral responsibilities, just like Dan said. Um, you've also got this notion of a moral patient, which is one which is like the mouse or even the cat or something or a small child or whatever, where they might not know the difference between right and wrong, but it still doesn't mean that they um, that it's not wrong to harm them or whatever. So like that's why you could have a, a responsibility uh, like to a mouse or something to ensure that it's not being like unnecessarily tortured by an animal, even if the animal's technically not doing anything wrong because they're not aware of it. I just think it's worth also mentioning just as a quick side point. I mean, it could be the case that morality applies to animals, provided they meet the rationality conditions themselves. I mean, right. who knows, right? And maybe some animals do meet that. There is actually some evidence for what might call proto-morality in animals. My, my favorite example is that you have a rat placed in a sort of small tube, um, see-through, with a door that can only be opened from the outside. Another rat is introduced, and what you find is the other rat will open the door and let its compadre. But what's really interesting is if you then do the experiment where you put two of these contraptions in and one of them has chocolate chip cookies in it, the rats, you know, I might be tempted to eat the chocolate chip cookies and then rescue my friend uh, because, hey, I'm rescuing you. You can not begrudge me the cookies, right? But no, the rat actually rescues the friend first, then 
they, they share the cookies together. But what's really interesting is they only do this for other rats that look like them. For rats that don't look like them, they don't do this unless they've been socialized with those other rats, and then they do. So that looks very, very similar to how, you know, maybe people who are brought up in a more multicultural society would be less likely to be racist. It does seem like there's a proto-morality in animals. It's not quite as simple as we've got with morality. There's nothing in animals. Yeah, that's fair enough. I think that that's super interesting. But I also think that, that kind of, in a way, it conflicts with what I was saying a moment ago, because um, rats don't have the sense of rationality required under the standard conditions to be moral agents, even if they, beha- they, they display behavior that looks like that. That's not evidence then, therefore, because they're moral, then they must have rationality, right? That, you couldn't even make that inference. Um, but I guess... Um, well, I think the point I, the points I want to make is that Craig it's pretty relevant to the standard Craigian version of the argument. There's another version of moral argument, which is called the abductive version, which is we're just going to take a bunch of moral facts and see what's the best explanation of them. And um, that should be part of the facts that uh, you include when you're asking what's the best explanation for where morality comes from. And it'd be weird if God wrote morality in our hearts, as Craig claims, uh, but had a little bit in animals, you know, a, a trace of it. I think it's very strange. Okay, yeah, actually, so I think the thing that's important to bear in mind here is that, like, um, it's by no means mandatory if you're, like, not a theist to think that the notion of morality that you have is a direct consequence of evolution or something, right? That it's um, the... I think that evolution provides you with, like, rough and ready behavioural principles that are conducive to the survival of your you know, tribal or whatever, but that actually in many ways it it furnishes you with like the wrong intuitions. And um, for instance, like you just said with the rats, they're more likely to favor other rats that they look like them or that they've been socialized with, but that's not a morally relevant principle. So like they are acting in a way that's not conducive with morality. And you can just reflect upon that. It's kind of Peter Singer idea of like expanding the the circle of like what, what you should care about to include things that are not like you. And that seems to me completely right. And um, the basic, very simple thing I want to say about this is just that, like, you shouldn't expect morality. And like, an atheist isn't doesn't necessarily have to be committed to the, this thought that morality just falls out of evolution or something. And, and then, you know, then all you have to do is point out that evolution doesn't, you know, doesn't give you perfect uh, morality and then it kind of undermines it or something. And rather, morality and sense of morality, in my view, is something like the appreciation of mathematics or whatever that doesn't. You know, that isn't given by evolution, but the kind of prerequisites for you to be able to reason abstractly is uh, something that evolution is selected for because it's super useful for like making tools and running away from the right things and blah, blah, blah. It just happens that also when you turn that tool, it's good for survival in certain respects upon reflecting on abstract things like mathematics or whatever, that starts to like you have gain its own um, momentum. And then over time, it's culture really that's driving the progression of our understanding of things like mathematics and I think also morality too. It's we teach each other stuff, we remember things that previous people have said in the past and we build and all of that stuff. That's like after evolution, it's called transcended evolution at that point. A cultural development isn't just what natural selection provides you. And it's it's kind of super reductive to think that all the atheists can do is appeal to some like uh I you know an evolutionary account of why we have moral right. facts as if there's no cultural or sociological explanation that's going on. I too. think it's also crucial that uh, the atheist is not committed to the view that morality has to be grounded in, in culture or human subjectivity or, um, you know, we brought up the debate with Wielenberg before. For someone like Wielenberg or someone like Plato or Aristotle, uh, morality simply has, you know, it has very little to do with uh, culture, human subjectivity, or whatever sorts of processes might have brought human beings into existence. Um, and the other thing that's worth bringing out here is that atheism, so in this video, we were told that like the atheist has to think that the uh, human beings are mere animals that resulted from this evolutionary process by chance. Evol- so atheism is just the view that there are no gods. It says nothing at all about where humans came from. An atheist could think that humans have always existed, they might think that humans uh, spontaneously came into existence at some arbitrary point in the past. 
they might think that human beings resulted from some other kind of process. There's, you know, as a matter of fact, many atheists, in, at least in our culture, do believe in evolution. Uh, but that's just a, you know, that, that's, I take it that that's just because we have very strong evidence that evolution is true. Right? It. it turns out that most Christians in, say, uh, England, um, I don't know about the United States, but at least in, in England also believe uh, in, in evolution. And, you know, it, it's, they're certainly not committed to the view that human beings are, are mere animals that resulted from a chance process. Well, likewise, um, the atheists need not be committed to any such view. All right, so let's move on. We're running out a little bit over time. So let's go to the next clip about objective and moral. Every time you say, hey, that's not fair, that's wrong, that's an injustice, you affirm your belief in the existence of objective morals. We're well aware that child abuse, racial discrimination, and terrorism are wrong for everybody, always. Is this just a personal preference or opinion? No. The man who says that it is morally acceptable to rape little children is just as mistaken as the man who says two plus two equals five. All right, so again, just before we go to Alex and Dan, I feel there was a misquote of Michael Rose. Whenever there's a quote from William Lane Craig, there's, there's sort of usually something dodgy going on. So I actually spoke to Michael Rose, I, I, and he said he was unfairly quoted. And um, I thought, can we get you on camera saying that? We had a very long chat rather than a short one. So I did a quick edit of it, and, um, you, and, and he approved it. He said, so let's have a quick look at that. I don't think morality is objective in the sense of something written in tablets of stone or given by God. Being moral or not moral is an adaptation. Why do I think it's okay, it's not okay to rape small children? It's obviously not a personal decision. I didn't make this decision. It was something imposed on me. But why isn't it, as it were, something which can fluctuate up and down? And according to whether it's, you know, in the Sahara, it's a good thing to rape people. And in the Arctic, it's not a good thing to rape people. Well, the answer is, these are all, it's all a question of adaptation. In the, in the Sahara and in the Arctic, we have the same constraints and needs to interact, uh, interact socially. Those of our ancestors who said, oh, you know, I, I believe it, but uh, it's only a, it's a myth, so we can just break it, you know, without any worries. Uh, well, aren't going to work then? They're not going to survive and reproduce. My position is not that complex. Uh, you know, so that's what another thing which rather pisses me off about Craig, because it's not like I'm, you know, doing quantum mechanics with him and expect him to work with imaginary numbers and all of those sorts of things. You know, I'm working at, at, at a fairly basic philosophical level, and Craig is certainly capable of dealing with that. All right, that was a quick aside. Uh, but anyway, um, Alex, why don't you start us off with uh, what, you know, I think some of the viewers are going to want to know, well, what are sort of non-theistic accounts of objective morality? Can you give us some examples that you think might be plausible? Um, yes. So, I mean, on the largest scale, uh, so realism, moral realism breaks down. I mean, so, and what that means is effectively that there are, um, there are, claims in morality that could be true or false, because that's already a point that some people could disagree with. They might say moral claims are more like expressions of emotion that are not true or false or something, They're emotivist or expression, expressivist. Um, so realists, for one, disagree with them. They think that there are true moral state or the truth act moral statements. They also think that some of them are true, right? That there are some claims you can make that uh, are truth act and actually true. So that distinguishes them from the error theorists who think there are the truth act, they could be true, but it just happens that none of them are true. They're all false, right? That's an, an error theorist. Like, um, like Mackey, I think, was an error theorist. Yeah. Um, and then uh, going further, you, there's a distinction between naturalists and non-naturalists. So naturalists will, will be the type of people who think that there are some true um, moral claims, but that they, they are explicable entirely in naturalistic terms. So it might be something like, um, you might say, 
that the uh, so I guess Sam Harris. I really yeah. hate Sam Harris, but maybe we should just refer to him. Um, he offers a version of this theory where it's something to do with like well-being uh, of, of humans, right? So you can like quantify that down in terms of their like brain states and blah blah blah. So actions are good if and only if they correlate with like these types of um, mental uh, brain states, I suppose, or physical states that they could be in. Um, and then non-naturalists, which is a tradition that started off by Moore, who we talked about earlier, um, basically think that there's no that there's no naturalistic kind of explanation or uh, grounding. Grounding, there's there's nothing. Yeah, there's no kind of paraphrase of X is good in terms of some like non-normative thing, um, right? Like so, Moore thinks there's this like open question argument where whenever you say like X is good, just means say. God commands that X. Where you, you, whenever anyone offers some kind of reduction like that, you can always say, "Well, look, God commands that X, but is X good?" And he thinks that the kind of meaningfulness of that question undermines the identity of the two things together. Um, you know, because if you say uh, this is a, uh, you know, this is a triangle, but has it got three sides? Right? That kind of that question betrays just a kind of conceptual ignorance that is not betrayed by sort of questioning whether or not one of God's commands is actually exemplifying a moral duty, right? You could question, should we kill the Canaanites? It doesn't feel like a conceptual mistake in the same way as our questioning whether a triangle might have three sides. Um, so this, I mean, that's a very broad brush, just like a quick gamut of like all of the different um, positions you could have. I suppose only the last three, that na no, well, naturalism and uh, non-naturalism. I guess error theory also counts as an objectivist theory too. Um, so they're all, options available to people um and and so it on this what's nice about the uh, naturalism non-naturalism distinction is actually that divine command theory comes out as a version of naturalism because i mean as i just said it's that they're offering a reduction of what the term x is good right. means into something else and, and that bears out in the uh, sorry that bears out in the literature as well because there's so you know you mentioned sam harris as an example of a, of a naturalist um, if people want to see something more sophisticated than than Sam Harris, they want to see like actual philosophers defend uh, ethical naturalism. One of the places to look is there's a view called uh, Cornell realism. We don't need to get into what exactly Cornell realism is, but uh, when um, I think it was Robert Adams was developing his modified divine command theory, he was inspired by the Cornell realists. So he takes some of what the Cornell realists are doing, but then takes out something that's uh, you know, prototypically natural and inserts something supernatural in its place. Um, well, if you are uh, Adams or, or Arlson and you give up uh, God, there's a very natural place to go, right? Which is Cornell realism. So there's, it seems like this is again, a reason to think that the moral argument is not going to succeed because the, someone who thinks about things in a way that's very similar to Adams or Arlson has a place to go for their ethics uh, with our meta ethical view that um, is uh, is entirely naturalistic. Can I just to circle back to the clip um, that we played yeah. from Craig's video right at the beginning? It just seemed to me that it was um, in itself a fallacious um, attempt to show that uh, like moral realism is true. You, you don't get to prove that moral realism is true just by saying. Um, but you know, everyone agrees rape is wrong or something. That doesn't establish <laughs> that moral realism is true, right? I, you know, even someone who's I'm sympathetic to moral realism, I think I still think the job is harder than that, right? You have to do more than that. Right. Anti-realists will still just agree, right? There's no anti-realists are not uh, unethical people, right? They might have all of the same views about what's right and wrong as an as a moral realist, right? There's there's absolutely nothing between them. You can't just appeal to uh, our intuitions about what's right and wrong, and then said, therefore, moral realism is true. I mean, That's right. Presumably, if you are if you are a subjectivist about aesthetics, you can still say a sunset is beautiful. You're not going to disagree that sunset is beautiful. You're just going to disagree about what the nature of the beauty right. is. Right. It's so nothing to do. A, if you have a really naive view about, if you're a subjectivist and have a really naive view about your your subjectivism, you just say all it means to say that something is good is that you you like it. Well, if you say, uh, you know, I was treated unfairly, maybe all that means is I dislike how I was treated. Well, if you say that I dislike how I was treated, and it's true that you dislike how you were treated, then when you say that you were treated unfairly, you said something true, right? So it doesn't, it, it, the, the debate is not settled there. The, you know, philosophers have a much more sophisticated way of appreciating these issues. 
Right. I mean, to be fair to Craig, it is a short five minute video. So, so we'll cut a little bit of slack there. But, yeah, right. never... but also, to be fair, Craig, he hasn't actually published a peer reviewed journal article defending the argument. So, like, we've got nothing better than this. To <laughs> or interacted with the contemporary meta ethics literature basically anywhere. I mean, he's done the, he did the debate with Wielenberg, which I guess is the closest that you can find. But you'd be hard pressed to find some place where he's like debating, uh, you know, Richard Boyd or something like the, the the space of views that he's actually considered is very small. And typically, all he does is he appeals to uh, some like nineteenth century nihilists or something. Right? He says, "Oh, Nietzsche says that morality is is dead or something," and, and it's like, well, who cares? You know, there's a whole lot else to philosophy than what some uh, very small sample of people have said. And you can always pick out some some figures who said things that other people are going to disagree with. Right. Now, let me ask you a question, because I have to say my own personal view is I, I, I find it hard to decide between moral realism or anti-realism. Uh, and I noticed that in the your paper survey, there was uh, a 12 percent of philosophers that didn't sign up to either. And and I'm, I'm thinking that, you know, maybe um, um, morality is a strange thing. Where some of the properties, I asked, like, what are the properties of objectivity or subjectivity? So to be subjective, I, I, I sort of looked around, and one of the properties is it's measurable. Well, morality doesn't feel like it's measurable. The other is independent of mind, um, and morality seems to depend on mind. But the other is that it's um, prone to reason. Like, I couldn't reason someone out of strawberry is the best flavor of ice cream. I couldn't give you an argument. No, 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 it's chocolate. But I could reason you of a moral position, you know. Um, so it seems like oh, it meets some of the criteria for objectivity, but not all of the criteria. And is it is it plausible to say maybe it just doesn't fit so easily into these simplistic categories? Possibly, yeah. It might not be the most helpful thing to say. So I mean, sometimes, well, when you're cashing out what moral realism is, you know, typically you'll say that it's like true fact, true, and true independent of anyone's um, opinions. I mean, is that the same as objectivity? I mean, it very, very much overlaps with it. Is it necessarily exactly the same? I don't know. But um, it feels to me that it's a cleaner way of understanding it. The problem really is the, the vagueness of object, objectivity, I think, not, not right. necessarily the vagueness of like how morality works. So if we just right. didn't have that word on the table and I just offered you that three-part definition of moral realism and that's what we were talking about, I think there's a lot of those questions might go away but i mean look at, at the end of the day morality moral philosophy is very difficult and those the concepts are um not easy to, to play around with absolutely i mean um more said something like um morality is like mathematics except much harder <laughs> which <laughs> most people wouldn't understand intuitively you think it wouldn't be harder it'd be easier but he thought it was much harder um yeah. anyway dan's dropped off yeah dan's dropped off so i hope he will come back in we put dan back so great but we're yes. running over time. So um, I'm going to cut the very last clip about the lawgiver and, and go to Richard Swinburne, because I think this is really interesting. A lot of uh, theists might think, OK, we've got three atheists and they're criticizing an argument for God. Uh, what's often not brought up in these debates is that the most uh, prominent Christian philosopher thinks the moral argument doesn't work um, and, and shouldn't be used by theists. So I want to give uh, him a voice here and let's see what he has to say. Hitler was wrong to exterminate the Jews, okay? And that is true of our world. Now, there couldn't be another world which is identical with our world in all the physical respects, but in which Hitler wasn't wrong to exterminate the Jews. Now, what that shows is that there must be necessary truths of morality. And if we have necessary moral truths, what does that imply about God? Well, it implies if they're necessary truths, they hold whatever else is the case. And therefore, you can't argue from them to the existence of God, because an argument to the existence of God involves pointing to some phenomenon which is such that you would expect if there is a God, and you wouldn't expect if there isn't a God. But this you would expect whatever is the case. All right. Dan, you uh, went to a, a conference on, uh, what was it, Christian philosophy? And talk uh, about yes, it, was a, it was a division meeting of the Society of Christian Philosophers. Uh, I gave a talk there on uh, that was related to the moral argument. And so while I was talking to other conference goers, most of whom, as you might expect, were Christians, because the Society of Christian Philosophers, and I was sort of the token atheist, I want to know what people thought about the, the moral argument. I want to know, like, what is the, the general impression by Christian philosophers of the moral argument? Now, of course, I didn't take any sort of, like, formal survey. 
but everyone that I talked to uh, thought that the moral argument failed. Most of them thought that um, that morality was just independent of God. Um, there were some people who thought that uh, morality wasn't independent of God, that is that God somehow metaphysically grounds morality, but they thought the moral argument doesn't succeed because they thought the only reason, like they thought that it was convincing for them that God grounds morality is because they already believe in God for independent uh, reasons, right? So since they were moral realists and they believed in God, they could then fit morality into their overall metaphysical picture by thinking that God does this sort of explanatory work. But most of them, in fact, thought that that wasn't even true, that morality um, was just independent of God, that there was no connection between the two. And, you know, since then, you know, that conference was a while, I think it was like eight or so years ago. Uh, and in the intervening time, you know, I've known other Christian philosophers, I've known uh, Christian grad students, Christian professors of philosophy. Um, the overall impression that I've consistently gotten uh, is that the run-of-the-mill Christian philosopher, uh, not the person that's out doing like a religious apologetics or something, uh, thinks that the moral argument is just a bad argument. Um, I think that that's a respectful position for, for Christians to hold. In fact, that's the, it's a very long running position. Like I said earlier in this discussion, ever since Plato and Aristotle, so for the past 2,400 years or so, um, philosophers have known about ways to metaphysically ground objective morality that had nothing at all to do with, uh, with God. Right, Alex. What do you think about this idea that if if moral if moral truths are objective, then they must also be necessary, and if they're necessary, they can't depend on God? Is that a good summary of Swinburne's argument? It did sound like what he was saying, and if it is what he's saying, it doesn't sound right to me. Um, I I don't see why you can't ground just because a truth is necessary doesn't mean it's not grounded in something else. I mean, oh, so I, I can actually answer this. Uh, Go on. So for Swinburne, um, Swinburne, unlike many other Christians, thinks that God only contingently exists. Well, true. he thinks that, but, but also thinks that uh, the moral facts hold in every possible world. So there are possible worlds on Swinburne's view in which there are the same moral facts as there are in our world, but uh, God doesn't exist. So it can't be the case that the cool. moral facts are then grounded in God. That's right, because necessary things couldn't be grounded in contingent things. That makes sense perfectly. Right. But presumably he wasn't just saying, on my view, it's not the case that, um, uh, that morality is grounded in God just simply because of that uh, contingency necessity thing. I thought he was trying to say, well, what he was actually saying, I think, was um, because moral truths are necessary um, and they'd be the same you know, across every possible world, then it doesn't give you any range of things to, to develop a kind of expectation. And, and what he's doing is this kind of probabilistic argument, it's like a Bayesian version of the argument. But that's just not what Craig's doing. So it just seems completely irrelevant to Craig's version of the argument. For Craig, he doesn't think God is contingent. He most mostly don't hold Swinburne's view there. But also Craig isn't building a kind of abductive or probabilistic case for the conclusion. So it doesn't really matter that there's not this variance across worlds or something where you could say that this conforms to or defies our expectation. I mean, who cares about that? The, the moral argument that's according to Craig is a straightforward deductive argument. And it's about the metaphysics of morality. It's not, nothing to do. So, you know, is, is it, are they just talking past each other? I mean, I'm just not sure how Swinburne is with, with, with Craig. So if I were to yeah. define Swinburne, I think there's two things that can be said here. One of them is that Swinburne, like many philosophers, is attracted to the view that uh, concrete entities cannot be necessarily existent. Mm -hmm. Only abstracta can be. If that's right, then since the good is an abstract. I'm going to have to explain what concrete entity. I don't know that everyone oh, understands. Yeah, sure. So uh, concrete, so there, there's this distinction that uh, philosophers have between particular objects and abstract objects. So the example I sometimes use with students is like numbers. So if I ask you to show me the number two, sometimes students will, you know, like show me, well, here's two apples. I say, no, that's not the number two. That's, those are apples. Um, if I, if I say, you know, if they, if they try to write the number two, they say, no, see, that's the symbol that represents the number two. That's not the number two itself. Plato had this idea that, uh, abstract objects like numbers, um, are, have this, are categorically distinct from anything, any particulars, but the particulars can, uh, be said to instantiate the abstract objects. In other words, the abstract objects can be thought of as the, in some senses, the things that are shared by multiple instances. So when it comes to uh, morality, the uh, goodness 
is something that's shared by all of the instances of good things. And goodness itself, uh, Plato would say, is, is an abstract object. In fact, Plato thinks that it's the, the highest of all of the abstract objects, the highest of the forms, the one that emanates all of the other uh, forms. Now, someone doesn't have to be committed to the, all of those details about Platonism to be committed to the existence of abstracta, but most philosophers are going to say that there is this, um, this distinction between, uh, this fundamental distinction between abstracts on the one hand and particulars or concreta on the other. And people are going to say that God um, is one of the, it's not an abstract object. God is a concrete object. Um, God is a, is a particular, it's the God is something that can have properties. Um, and the, the way that a Platonist might look at this issue is they would say, well, God is the thing that is an instance of a good thing, but it's a perfect instance of a good thing. It's the, of all of the good things that there are, God is the, the highest out of all of them, but it's still nonetheless, just one of the instances. Um, and most philosophers are going to say that for any concrete object, that concrete object only has contingent existence. In other words, that there are metaphysically possible uh, worlds or th there's a way that things could have been metaphysically such that um, that thing didn't exist. And if you are attracted to a view like that about concreta, and you're also attracted to a view about abstracta, that abstract objects by their nature necessarily exist, then you're going to say that, that goodness uh, necessarily exists and so necessarily grounds moral facts, whereas God as a concrete entity uh, must have contingent existence. And so God couldn't be one of the things that grounds um, properties like goodness or indeed any other property. You're watching the um, Craig Wielenberg debate, because uh, Wielenberg, his position is, um, uh, one that appeals to abstract objects and given that Dan's just made the explanation that I don't have to then explain anything else about that he's he basically just sort of saying something about like the good being an abstract object or, or moral um, duties being abstract objects right he's a moral platonist right yeah. and that that that's fine but Craig offers one um, objection to this uh, where he, he gives a lengthy quote by Peter Van Ingwagen who's um, a Christian philosopher but I would argue the the preeminent Christian philosopher living at the moment, um, although he holds very strange views in some respects. But anyway, Craig reads out this big passage of Van Ingwagen where he says, look, the distinction between abstract and concrete is kind of strange, right? You're bifurcating the world into two different parts. Um, and the differences between those two parts are completely radical. Right? There's nothing like the difference between any abstract object and any concrete object is more than the difference between any two concrete objects. So like a pen is more similar to God than um, the pen is to the number two, right? So any two concrete objects, no matter how different they are, are more similar to each other than any concrete object to any abstract object. Um, and that's sort of peculiar and an Occam's razor kind of thought would be, well, we should probably do try and do without this um, strange new category of things, right? The concrete objects that we have immediate experience with them, they're very well, like uh, grounded in, in our everyday comings and goings, but abstract objects do seem to be kind of like less required, only philosophers think about them, blah, blah, blah. So if we can get rid of abstract objects, we should. And so there's a kind of presumption in favor of nominalism, which is a view that there are only concrete objects. And then Craig just sort of stops the quote there, but I, I dug out the paper and kept reading. And it's crazy because like on the, I think on the same page as that quote ends is like the beginning of section two, though basically um, Van Ingwarden says, we should do without um, uh, abstract objects, um, if we can possibly get away with it. And then the section two is called why we can't possibly get away with it. You need to have abstract well, in fact, <laughs> Craig and Van Inwagen have debated this point, right? So Van Inwagen thinks that uh, there are abstract objects, thinks that they're independent of God, yeah. thinks that they can't be grounded in God. Um, and so for Van Inwagen, when Van Inwagen says that God you know, created everything. He, what Ben Wagen means is that God created all of the concrete objects other than God's self, but the abstract objects that Ben Wagen thinks necessarily exist and necessarily exist independent of God. Yeah, and it, it just struck me that, like, I, I'm sure Craig knows that um, Ben Wagen's views on abstract objects. I mean, obviously, like you said, he really debated, but it's a famous right. and well known position. So it just struck me that, like, I'm not sure that Craig's like deliberately trying to mislead the audience or being ignorant or something, but it did strike me as like, if you're going to appeal to Van Ingwagen as an authority saying that there's a presumption in favor of uh, nominalism, 
it did seem a bit strange to not complete the sentence and say, of course, he's he doesn't agree with me about this, but blah, blah, blah. It's like he was wheeling out Benning work and as an authority to try and... Sh it gave the impression that there's this philosopher that's on his side against Wielenberg, when in actual fact... Um, Venning work and those completely on the same side as, as Wielenberg on the question of whether abstract objects exist. It just seemed to me quite like bad scholarship. I mean, it was in a debate, it wasn't even a published journal or anything, but like, I mean, come on, it was, it, I didn't like what, it. What I said earlier was if you find a quote from a scholar by William Lane Craig, oh, that William Lane Craig was you, definitely read the whole thing because you'll yeah. probably find something quite different embedded in that. All right, well, there I think we should leave it. We've run over time again. We're trying to bring it into an hour, but I, maybe that will never happen. <laughs> um, <laughs> anyway, if you like, if you like this content, please like and subscribe. If you have any views on these topics, definitely put them in the comments. If you have suggestions for future topics, please put them in the comments, and we'll see you next time on the Sci-Fi Show. Thanks, guys. Cheers.